Over the last 100 years, the world has been brainwashed. In this video, I'm going to explain how. Who do you think poses a greater risk to your safety as a pedestrian, cars or bikes? Bikes. Bikes. Bikes, I think. Oh, I think bikes. And what if I said that cars kill 500 pedestrians a year and bikes kill two? I would say that those cars are often killing people because bikes are forcing them over the middle of the road and causing problems. I flagged down a whole load of people and more than half said exactly that. Why? Why are we blind? Not just to that statistic, but all of the others that show that driving is a huge public health hazard. And if you found that slightly triggering, you've been brainwashed too. In this video, I'm going to speak to a leading psychologist who has been researching this subject. It's that even people who don't drive are excusing people who drive and downplaying the harms of motoring because it looks like we've just all taken on board the message and it's hardly surprising. As well as speaking to a politician, the former Transport Minister for Wales, who put into place a policy that seemingly challenged our endemic car culture. And the evidence is very, very clear about this. This is not up for debate. Um, reduces the number of deaths, reduces the number of casualties, but also, critically, changes the feel of a neighbourhood. It is not an exaggeration to say that driving is causing a public health hazard of epic proportions. We're not just talking about crashes and collisions which kill and injure. In the UK alone, there are 40,000 premature deaths per year as a result of pollution from cars. And let's not even get started on the countless more premature deaths that result from inactivity fostered by our culture of driving everywhere. And yet, we don't even notice. Our lives are enslaved to cars, but most of us just want more. Why? Motonormativity, that's why. I'm on my way to Swansea in Wales to meet Professor Ian Walker. He's the head of psychology at the university there. He coined the term motonormativity in a piece of research whose findings kind of blew my mind. Ian, firstly, can you talk me through what you actually found out in this research? Yes, we took over 2,000 people around the country, uh, randomly gave them either a set of questions about driving or the same set of questions with a couple of words changed that so wasn't about driving, and we found that the responses became completely different. If you asked the same principle but mentioned cars, then people would go, oh yeah, that's completely fine. And if you ask the same principle but didn't mention cars, people would go, no, 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 that's completely wrong. So it really seemed like the mention of motoring changed the values that people were applying to the situation. For example, 87% of people disagreed with the statement that if you leave your car in the street and it gets stolen, it's your fault and the police shouldn't act. However, only 37% of people disagreed if it was your belongings that were stolen. Now, people also felt that while the risks associated with driving were acceptable, risks while working were not. But perhaps the most telling of all was that while 75% of people agreed that you shouldn't smoke in highly populated areas if people had to breathe in the fumes, only 17% agreed that you shouldn't drive in highly populated areas if people had to breathe the car fumes. Now, dangerous fumes are dangerous fumes. In this case, the harms of both are well documented. But it's striking that the cause of those fumes changes how they are perceived. Clearly, it's okay for people to die for the sake of cars, but not smoking. We think a big part of this is just because it's so culturally normal. Uh, cars coming first is everywhere around us. Everyone who is alive today has only ever known a world where cars come first. And it's reinforced everywhere you look. Go and look at how streets are designed. They're built so that the car goes first and the pedestrian waits or gets out of the way. Uh, go and look at the media reporting of traffic incidents where someone crashes their car and look how the media report it as 
an accident, an act of God, something that nobody could have prevented. Uh, look at how cars are advertised with speed and power and control and messages of status. Uh, all of the various things around us, including the other people that you see every single day when you go out in the street, all of these messages reinforce in the same direction. They all say, cars come first, the driving is important, driving is number one, the harms of driving are something we shouldn't think about. And so now we've got to a point where, where no one is actively sort of maliciously maybe portraying this message. It is just unconscious. We just all accept that this is, the car is king. It looks like it. I mean, one of the things that really jumped out to us when we did our survey work, and this has been repeated by other researchers since, is that people who don't drive tend to respond more or less the same. So it's not even like people are just excusing themselves unconsciously. It's that even people who don't drive are excusing people who drive and downplaying the harms of motoring because it looks like we've just all um, taken on board the message. And it's hardly surprising given how much that message is driven home to us through lots of different channels. And presumably as well, you asked questions where you, you knew that you were going to get these kind of responses. So you were kind of deliberately provoking. Yeah, and, but there's a difference between asking a question where you think you know what the answer is going to be and stacking the deck. The way we think of it is we set up questions in a way so that if there were biases out there, which we thought there would be, then they'd have a chance to show themselves. Uh, interestingly, when other people have repeated our experiment recently, they added extra situations. So they added, for example, uh, is it okay to play loud music in public where it disturbs other people? And that got treated the same as smoking. And it was still the car that was the odd one out. So yes, we set things up to find an effect, but it was only there because the effect was so strong and ready to be found. Professor Walker wanted to show us examples both of the outcomes of this moto normativity, but also how our built environments are part of the problem in the first place. It's not our fault that we think the car is king, because this message is reinforced to us countless times a day. There's a good example, uh, a sign for the people driving past, but look where the space is taken from. Space comes from the pedestrians for the needs of the driver, and probably no one even noticed there was going to be a complication from this. Well, yeah, because you, you would never put a sign in a road, would you? Because people need to drive past it, right? People need to walk past it. Yeah. yeah. And this, is, this isn't the worst, I've seen. You'll see a lot of like this where you couldn't possibly get a wheelchair past it or a pushchair. So here's another interesting example of these sort of typical flared bellmouth roads. Okay. So this is a little residential road. And you'd think it would be a T-junction. You'd think a T-junction would be a T like that at right yeah. angles but they're never at right angles. They always have these big flared entrances and exits. The main reason being so the vehicles don't have to slow down as they come in and out of the junction. Okay. Now, that might make sense if you're driving a vehicle, you don't want to slow down, but it makes a lot less sense if you're a pedestrian. And especially, looking at the tactile pavement here for blind people or visually impaired people, yeah. if you're visually impaired, because we're being told to cross here, not only is the road twice as wide as it needs to be, yeah. but it's twice as wide and intended that vehicles would be going faster. Yeah. So it's increasing the danger to pedestrians for the convenience of motorists. And I suspect no one's noticed this. Every day people will walk up in here or drive around here and the person walking every day is given a little bit of friction, a little bit of danger every day. The person driving every day is given a little bit of smooth and ease and convenience. It's, and you might have 20, 30, 40, 50 of these every day. It's no wonder people get the message, please drive, don't walk. All right then, ready? Here we go. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen versus one, two, three, four, five, six. Six and a bit. That's ridiculous, isn't it? And it's like it's a quiet residential street, and yet you're funneled around the corner at warp speed. Here we've got, I need to go there, that person needs to go there, who just by default is given freedom of movement and who has to ask permission and wait. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be this way. Could be the other way around. There could be a, an induction coil in the road so that this is green by default, but it notices when a car comes and changes after a little pause. Yeah. 
but it doesn't. And it's always the pedestrian, the healthy, active traveler who walks. And it's hard to notice, look, not a lot of healthy, active travelers. Maybe this constant friction, this constant messaging that you're in the way is a part of that. Yeah. I think what we need is we need policymakers to be looking around and saying, look, we can't just build the world we had in the past. And we especially can't just build the world we had in the 1960s. We need to build a world, a physical world and a legal world that is the world we want to see. Because uh, if we shape a world that encompasses what we want to see, that will start to happen. You've got to build it before the behaviour comes. To me, it seems clear. Once you start to look, it is everywhere. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. This is on my commute home from work. Pedestrians rerouted into the bike lane, two lanes kept open for cars, but the cycling infrastructure is just expendable. I get the rationale of keeping the traffic moving, but that's what makes it worse, prioritizing cars over personal safety. I also posted this video to Instagram and felt the full force of car brain in action. To even challenge car culture evidently requires thick skin, but imagine trying to actually do something about it. Back over in Wales, the government there implemented two policies, both of which should benefit the country, one of which will directly save lives, but that challenged car culture and caused an uproar. Lee Waters was the Minister for Transport responsible for implementing them. People will do what is easy. And over 70 years, we've made it the easiest, most convenient way to get around is to jump in a car. We've made other forms of transport cumbersome. We introduce friction. Essentially, we've made it harder. And so people do what is easy. A bunch of things need to come together. You need to change the engineering. You need to change the, uh, the culture. You need to incentivize uh, the right behaviors. You also need to disincentivize the behaviors that uh, get in the way. Lowering the speed. And the evidence is very, very clear about this. This is not up for debate. Uh, uh, reduces the number of deaths, reduces the number of casualties, but also critically changes the feel of a neighbourhood uh, and allows more social interaction. So when there is less noise and there is less sense of danger, people are more likely to go out and about. They like to talk to their neighbours. They like to allow their children to play in their streets. Their community feels different, and that then encourages and enables a different type of behaviour. And did the extent of the opposition to that policy surprise you then? Because hearing you talk about it, it, it makes total sense. It sounds like a really nice thing to implement, but but it really it really triggered a seemingly a large proportion of people. Yeah, well, we knew it was going to be difficult. Every time anybody has introduced a change in the rules of the road, there has been controversy. If you read back to when the Belisha beacons were introduced in the 1930s, you know, those poles with the orange lights on top, there was a pro. Fast forward to uh, drink driving laws, Barbara Castle in the 60s introduced the breathalyzer, huge abuse and resistance. So there's this real, uh, we're hitting on culture here. This is not about evidence and facts uh, and, and rules. This is about how people feel. And we've, we've got to a point in our society where people's feelings around their rights as motorists uh, are, are not just about uh, uh, rationale and facts. They're about how they feel, they're about their identity, they've got a sense of culture, about their relationship with the state. So that's really complicated. Now we've had nine months, I think, since, um, or nine months people get used to this lower speed limit. What's the perception? Do you think amongst the amongst the public now? Before this came in, we were looking at the example of uh, congestion charging in London when that was first introduced. And there's an academic uh, in Bristol uh, called Phil Goodwin who did some research around that, and he came up with a change curve, which is called the Goodwin curve, which is taken from that uh, congestion charging, uh, and that essentially shows that. You know, sometime out when you're talking about the concept, support for the principle is high. And as you get closer to implementation, that support dips. So the curve goes like that. And then nearest to the point of implementation, it 
hits rock bottom and during implementation. But then as people get used to it, the curve rises again and support starts to build. And that's what happened in London with congestion charging. And that's what we were anticipating would happen in Wales with 20 mile an hour. And that is what is happening. We, you know, we'll need to be some time out to get the falls of a uh, wide angle lens view of, of the trend. My sense is, is that it's taken longer in Wales and the dip has gone deeper than we anticipated. But we are definitely now starting to come out the other side. And the evidence uh, nine months in is, is confirming what we anticipated would happen and what has happened in London, what's happened in Edinburgh, what's happened in Spain, where this has been done. You know, the, the impact on casualties and deaths uh, has been consistent. Is it too early to tell whether or not you're starting to get a shift in people's transport um, habits as well? Like, are, are people driving less now? We need several years of data to be able to properly assess full impact but when we can look at London and Edinburgh for example which I mean which have a number of years of of proper data behind this what we are seeing is that speeds are down without enforcement so this is a self-regulating in in in, in large uh, behavior um, there are fewer deaths and casualties but also levels of cycling and walking are up because as common sense would tell us people feel it is safer and if they are involved in a collision their chances of being seriously hurt are are less I guess one thing I'd really love is to know whether or not you think there's anything that can be done about moto normativity. I think one of the things that's probably most promising and one of the things we're really not doing is the first step with any problem is to acknowledge there's a problem. Uh, and I think we're such a long way from that. You know, when was the last time you heard anything from government saying, your short car trips are a problem. Your short car trips are creating pollution that your neighbours are having to breathe. Um, when was the last time government sent a strong message saying, maybe try and walk a bit more? We don't see these things. We're not recognising that there's even a problem to be solved. And I think until we do that, until we collectively start to realise, until we start getting official messaging to help us realise that there is a problem here that needs to be solved, I don't know if we're going to make huge strides. And, and what would be the motive for the government? There's an obvious motive for governments in the savings that are coming to them. You know, the amount of money that the NHS is losing in this country or healthcare, healthcare worldwide, picking up the what an economist would call the externalities of motoring, the costs that are hidden from the system. So the healthcare costs of the diabetes, the Alzheimer's and all of these things that are linked to air pollution, the healthcare costs of the physical inactivity. So there's an immediate billions of dollars financial savings to be made, which should appeal to any government in this day and age. Um, and as part of that, one of the things that maybe governments could get more focused on is why are people driving in the first place? Very few people are in a car just to drive a car. They're, doing, they're using a car as a means to an end. It's not, they're not just driving for its own sake. They're going to the shops, they're going to visit their friends, they're taking children to school, they're getting to work, they're going to hospitals. Now, that's what people are actually trying to do and the car is just a way that they're doing it. But there's other ways you can do those things and the government could be making those other ways easier. Like, like with anything, if you don't recognise there's a problem, you're not going to address it. And you also, if you don't recognise there's a problem, you're not going to respond favourably to interventions that are intended to help. So, what do we take from all of this then? Well, you know about it now. That is perhaps the most important thing. What you choose to do next is entirely up to you. But just remember, it doesn't have to be this way. There is an alternative to car culture. Now, I'd be really, really interested to know your thoughts on this subject. So get involved in the comment section down below. Did you know that this was a thing prior to watching this video? Has it changed your perspective at all? And should we do anything about it? Like I say, get involved. Very, very interested to hear your thoughts. And also, please give this video a like as well if you've enjoyed this type of content. Let us know so we can make more.